Good morning to all of you guys. I'm looking forward to uh, having the panel discussion this morning with two of my guys. Uh, one of the best things you can do in my job is put good people into big jobs and see them be successful. Uh, and Emma and Luke are certainly part uh, of that in my job. So uh, I will quickly move through the introduction and get them up here. Um, it's been a big week already for women's football and uh, we still haven't played the sellout game that everyone has been uh, so looking forward to tomorrow afternoon out at Penrith. And then of course the Matildas going to Newcastle uh, and tickets are uh, still available for that but also selling well. That's quite phenomenal to think that uh, in the middle of a rugby league semi-final series including Penrith Panthers, uh, we're out on their home ground with a sellout with our Matildas Saturday afternoon. That certainly gives me uh, a little bit of personal satisfaction uh, given a previous life that I used to be in. Of course, the week started really importantly for us with the announcement of a collective bargaining agreement with the PFA for our W League players. Um, that, is, that was overdue, uh, but it was an important part of the strategic choices that FFA took uh, when we got our broadcast deal done last year and we looked across the huge length and breadth of the sport and where we needed to make decisions around funding. And one of the things that came clearly through uh, was that we needed to follow through on things that we'd been saying, put action, put words into action by actually moving towards having uh, some minimum pay and better working conditions uh, for players in the W League. There's been a lot going on in Australian sport with female sport uh, and it got lost a little bit that we've really been trailblazers in that space. To think that the W League, a national competition, is going into its 10th season uh, when other sports are only having their first and second seasons of national competitions, uh, I think shows that uh, football should be really proud of what it's done. But we recognise that we needed to do more and, and through work with our clubs, uh, with the PFA itself and of course uh, importantly player delegates that uh, came along to meetings because I think these things over the years I've always thought you actually have to get the clubs and the actual players in the room. The national body and the PFA itself can't get these things done unless the people who are actually at the coalface are involved. So of course that sort of thing takes weeks and months to get through uh, but again if you look across Australian sport I made the comment to someone on Monday we've had one of the smoothest negotiations for a collective bargaining agreement in recent times in Australian sport. And I think that's a credit to the PFA, to the delegates, uh, to our clubs, and of course to the people who worked on it at FFA. Um, the W League is only though part of the pyramid. Of course, the base of our pyramid is so strong uh, with participation, um, really growing at, at the fastest rate in the girls and women's game. Our, our Aldi Mini Roos program, um, which Emma and her people have worked so hard on in recent years, uh, is a great opportunity for young girls to play football. I think one of the reasons that we're seeing success in, in the Matildas um, is because we look back 10 or 15 years ago when sports like ours had introductory programs for young players and finally girls were getting a chance to just go out and kick a ball. Lo and behold, 10 years, 15 years later, some of them turned out to be pretty bloody good at it. And you see that across other sports as well with these introductory programs. When in the days when um, people of my generation grew up playing sport, it was only really the best players who very early on in the, in the journey got to actually kick the ball, swing a bat, um, et cetera, et cetera. Now these introductory programs like Mini Roos are getting, giving everyone a chance. And of course, if you've got skill, you'll rise to the top. Who'd have thought, I think it's probably unprecedented <coughs> in world sport at the moment, that a, a football club or a sporting club that operates a men's and a women's team would have a female player possibly the, the largest profile player now at the Perth Glory, Sam Kerr. That's quite extraordinary. And talking to Peter Philopoulos yesterday, the CEO of Perth Glory, I said to him, you've got to use Sam Kerr not only for the women's team, 
but you've got to use her for the men's team as well. It's not so much now about men's and women's football, it's about football. And Sam is, is a leading player in football, not just women's football. Hopefully we'll see her do uh, some backflips tomorrow and on Tuesday. Um, I've got it on reasonably good authority. She's going to be the page one story of the Sydney Morning Herald tomorrow. Um, they asked her to do a backflip uh, at the interview yesterday and she declined. Uh, and I thought that's probably good advice from Stadge. We don't need her doing backflips with newspapers. We want her doing them out on the field when she scores goals. Um, so, you know, gender equality uh, is a huge topic. It's an important topic. Um, I'd like to think we're a leading organisation for females already, but we recognise we've got a lot more that we can do. Um, and I think probably the right time now, Simon, for me to sit on the panel, um, say good day <coughs> to Emma and Luke, uh, and, he and hear what, uh, what you guys can throw at us. Thanks. So just wait for uh, Emma and Luke to come up on the stage, and we shall get going. Take a seat, guys. I'll stay up here. <clears throat> um, thanks for those words, uh, David. So, um, I'll, I'll start with you if I can. I'll ask you a curly question, not the first one I've probably asked you down the years about various things. Um, cynical people will, will look at the, the pay and conditions deal that you, you signed on Monday and whilst I don't think anybody doubts that it's, it's a bad thing, it's a great thing for, for women's football. But people will say, well, you're only doing that because the AFL women's competition has got such traction over the last 12 months. Is that, is that a, fair, a fair point? Uh, and I don't think it is fair. I think we have to... Is the microphone on? Microphone on, guys? I'm pretty loud anyway, but... Um, yeah, I've got... No, I don't think it is quite fair, but I also think we had to recognise that the competition has uh, become more intense and that means that we need to be making sure that we're, the, we're a good choice for, for young athletes, young girl athletes. It's, it's, not, it's not dissimilar to what, to what happens um, anywhere, which is, you know, the, the, the talented kids can play anything at an early age. So we need to be making sure they take us as the choice. And again, I'll go back to what Sam Kerr said this week, but she said it before, which is that she had choices. She could have played, she comes from an AFL family, she could have played AFL, but she recognises that she's been to an Olympics, that she gets to play around the world with the Matildas, and that for her is more important than perhaps the things that the AFL competition can offer her. Um, that's only one example though. So I, I think we've got, we do have to be really cognizant of the fact that we're in competition uh, and we needed to make sure that we took a step in the direction of setting some minimums. I mean, this, this is only the start of the journey. Um, we have to recognise that unless we grow from those minimum, we grow those minimum conditions over the next two, three, five, ten uh, years, um, then we, we, we won't have really achieved much at all. It's very much just the start of the, pro of the program, I think. Football, David, as, as we know, is a sport that's, in general, men's or women's, collectively, is not exactly flush with cash in, in the same way that the other codes are because of their much bigger TV deals. Um, in, in many ways, I suppose, when you're trying to put these programs and these contracts into place, you're, you're almost robbing Peter to pay Paul, or in this case, Pauline. Um, so where does the money come from for this, for this particular deal? Yeah, I think, as I said it at the start, um, we did have to take some tough decisions around, around the choices of things that we need to fund, and it's well documented that our A-League clubs still think we're not funding them enough for their their men's salary cap and their men's player cost, but um, I'm pleased to say that the clubs did get in behind the decision uh, to make sure that some of the TV money um, went towards the W League and increasing conditions in the, in the W League. Um, but even these games this week, uh, whether the Matildas are going to play, were part of a strategic choice that we had to take. We recognised that the Matildas were not playing at home often enough 
um, and to get, and Luke will probably speak to this, to get our commercial partners and new commercial partners to get behind the Matildas, we needed to, to not just tell them that they'll be at the Cyprus Cup or they'll be, at the, um, they'll, they'll be at the Olympics every four years or a World Cup every four years. We need to actually have them at home playing games. That costs money, but I'm pleased to say it was a strategic choice that we took. And I'm just picking up on what David said there about you know, the A-League clubs have come on board. Do you sense as the head of women's football that in the last 12 months, maybe a little bit longer than that, we've almost had this light bulb moment where people involved in the men's game have gone, actually, you know what, this is something not only that we should be doing, but we have to do. And we're, I think Anna Dong said yesterday, we've got this little moment in time where all of a sudden the vista has opened up and we've really got to score goals with it, haven't we? Absolutely. I think um, there's two things that I've observed over the last uh, two years that have made a real difference in terms of the particular A-League clubs having that kind of light bulb moment. The first one was when Melbourne City came in. Melbourne City came in the league and the, the way that they approached the development of their, their women's league was ensuring that they had treated the players equally in terms of the conditions and the support and they treated the players like professional players. And, and that made a massive difference and that shook the league up in year one. I think it took everyone by surprise. Um, and we had some discussions nationally around, you know, whether it was the right time to bring an additional team in, but they helped raise the bar. And then the second thing that's happened is obviously what's happened outside of football and this massive kind of movement towards um, increased investment in, in the women's game. And there's more competition now for athletes. So to David's point, we have to make sure that we're offering, you know, good um, pay, good conditions and, and good opportunities, not just for Matildas, but for players that might only play in the W League. What can we offer for those individuals that can still make a contribution? Um, but it is an opportunity, it is a moment in time um, you know, ensuring that we leverage on the Matildas and thread that through to the W League is important and ensuring that we're aligned. And I have to say, and I've said it before, you know, having gone through the CBA process, I feel really hopeful for women's football for the future because I actually feel like all stakeholders are aligned in, in one clear objective and that's that we're all ambitious to grow the women's game, we're ambitious to grow the W League. The clubs are there, the PFA are there and FFA are there as well. Just on that competition for, for athletes, Emma, um, again, we've we mentioned the AFL, but it's not just them. Obviously, the other codes, the, the other football codes, have particularly got their act together in terms of, you know, women's sports. And I, I read in the paper, I think it was only two days ago. You know, rugby league writers are now saying we've got to have, have a female competition, a national competition for rugby league as well. So that competition is only going to get more intense over the next few years. We've almost owned the space in many ways in terms of the football codes over the last few years. Do you worry, and have you got strategies in place to try and prevent that, that leakage of female athletes to the other sports? Um, I used to play the game. I like competition. Um, I think top competition is great. I mean, I work in that kind of uh, community space, and we've had competition, as David has said, in that introductory program space for quite a while. So I think it's actually going to have a great impact on, on, on the whole of the kind of women's sport um, sector. I think it's going to raise the bar for everyone. I think it's going to mean that broadcasters, um, and commercial partners are going to be far more engaged in terms of the value uh, of women's sport. Uh, but it does mean that we do have to be more focused on, on what our strengths are, and I think I touched on this yesterday. Football is in a unique position. Um, we can get girls playing at a really young age. It's a safe sport. Boys and girls can play together. It's, it's a sport that can be played by the whole family. And that's something that I think we really need to, to leverage. Uh, but you're right, we've got NRL coming. Um, cricket are obviously investing a fair bit. We've got rugby sevens. Um, but I actually do believe that if you kind of tie together all the elements of what our game offers and we stick to our strategy, I still think we can be a leading organisation for females. Luke, obviously your focus is the commercial arm of the game. What do we need to do to, to leverage more commercial opportunities? I, I imagine it'd be nice to just have 10 clubs like Melbourne City who could put a lot of money into the female game, but given that that might not happen in the short term, um, has the approach changed over the last couple of years in terms of the commercial outlook and uh, strategy, sorry, and, and the way you market the, the female game? Yeah, definitely, Simon. Look, the, just, just, just hold it as close up to your chin as we can. I'll start wrapping it. There we go. Um, <laughs> the, the fundamentals with women's sport are no different to any other, to, to men's sport or any other form of entertainment. We need as many eyeballs, we need as many people in the stadium, we need as many people playing as possible. Um, and commercial partners, yeah, they will invest and broadcasters will come. 
um, slip and chicken the egg, the, the more people that are involved in the game. So for us, um, there's definitely been, I think, a, a light bulb moment. I, you know, I think historically, sport in this country, not, not necessarily football in isolation, has probably taken women for granted as fans and as participants. There's a real light bulb moment over the last couple of years. And so we are very actively um, marketing football as a product at the participation level. Mini Roos has been a fantastic um, uh, opportunity for the game to offer a, a, an entry point for non-football or non-traditional football families to come into the game, and we're seeing some great results from that. We, you know, to David's point about, about Sam Kerr and Perth Glory, you know, the, the clubs have, have cottoned on to the idea that, hey, we're not men's football teams. You know, we're football clubs that, that serve both women and men and uh, are starting to market that way and, and the shining light of the <coughs> city. From an A-League and W-League point of view, this year we'll, for the first time, market the two leagues together, um, which is, we think, fantastic because it means a couple of things. It certainly means a lot more promotion of the W-League than we've ever had before. But it also to, is, is to the point about equality. It's about saying, you know what, both of these leagues are national leagues, both of these leagues are high quality, exciting entertainment experiences. And if you are a fan of Sydney FC or the Wanderers or Melbourne Victory or Melbourne City, then you should be following both teams because both teams are exciting and entertaining. Um, so it, we are, we are certainly more focused on making sure that we drive more eyeballs to the game. And if we do that, we'll see more interest from the commercial part. The West Mill Matildas, who of course so fabulously won the Tournament of Nations a few weeks ago. As a commercial man, are you sat in front of the TV going, you beauty? And you've got people ringing you up and, you know, every five minutes going, I want to be involved with this team, or does it not quite work like that? It doesn't quite work like that. <laughs> it, it's probably lucky it doesn't work like that, or I might be out of a job. But, um, no, look, absolutely. You know, w w the Tournament of Nations has been absolutely fantastic. But it's sort of the culmination to this point, and hopefully, because there's plenty more to come, but it's the culmination of a number of years of development. You know, this is a team now that is still, you know, pretty young, that's been growing over the, you know, since the last World Cup, through the Olympic Games, you know, the profile of this team hasn't happened overnight, hasn't just turned on. There's no doubt the Tournament of Nations has had a big impact. But even leading into the Tournament, the tournament of Nations, you know, the coverage on shows like Today and Sunrise and the news is far greater than what we were getting three years ago. Um, so there is, you know, it's, it's impo that's important because I, it's great to have a moment in the sun, but we're about more than moment, a moment in the sun. We're about building long-term um, viability for, for the game and for, for our athletes. And I think we're seeing that, it's only gonna get, get greater. You know, I think um, there are a lot of household names starting to emerge out of the Matildas team. In fact, you know, maybe, maybe Sam Kerr's the, other than Tim Cale, the most well-known name in Australian football at the moment. Probably the most well-known women's name in Australian sport. Um, we've still got to, we've got to continue to grow that. But uh, it, that, that's, you know, that's obviously very beneficial. But people don't just call, you gotta get out there and sell them. And it sold pretty well. Sell out tomorrow in uh, Penrith <laughs> in terms Absolutely. of bombs on seats, which is uh, uh, going to be a great spectacle at uh, Pepper Stadium uh, tomorrow. David, back to you. Um, women's sports at the moment is obviously not just a, a big issue in terms of the social conversation, but uh, it's a big political topic as well, isn't it? In that regard, is government, and we're speaking obviously as football people here, are they chipping in enough to help our game? I, I see lots of graphs and tables that appear periodically in, in the media which, which make my blood boil as a football fan where you see the participation levels of the sports like AFL and Rugby League and they're down there and their funding is up there. Ours is the other way around. Our participation is up there and our funding is down there. How do we change that? Is that just cultural? Is it media? Yeah, look, I think, uh, of course, we would always like more government assistance. Um, we've been frustrated in the last probably four years since Winnie Edge came in, um, that there's a lot of focus on Olympic gold in terms of high performance funding. Uh, and for us, whether it's our men's or our, indeed our women's team really, for us to make a World Cup um, is a significant achievement by our teams. Um, and, and of course, uh, we have had some frustration in that regard. However, um, good sign, we're, the recipients, Neely, um, Falves, um, Jane, of $5 million to uh, run a World Cup 2023. You see the signs over there. 
uh, bid, and uh, that's a sign that the government recognised that a World Cup, Women's World Cup, in 2023 in this country would be fantastic for for women's football, for football, and for Australia. Um, so that's a that's a start. Uh, but of course, yes, we would always like to see more funding. Um, we're seeing uh, one of the things that hasn't been mentioned. Um, and we can give your partner a wrap in this regard, Simon Steph. Um, we're seeing more and more um, eyeballs watching the W League on television. Um, we're going to have two games rather than one game this, this year. So Friday and Sunday will be on Fox Sports. Um, we're still in negotiations about a free to air partner in, the, in that space because we have had the ABC. But I think that again is a sign that. Um, we're starting to get some traction in that area, and if we get traction in that area, then um, government funding can flow. A really significant thing happened around participation in December, uh, which was those those Ausplay numbers came out, and really for the first time there was a uh, authentic apples for apples comparison of participation numbers across Australian sport, and we came out miles ahead. Um, and I think that had real credibility and it made people realise that some of the numbers that are getting thrown up by other sports were not as accurate as they might need to be. So that was a good moment for us and we, we bang on about those numbers as much as we can, don't we? And we do. Can I jump in there as well? Because I think two things that I see, and David's right, and we just had a meeting with Tal Karp on Wednesday and we were talking about you know the Victorian space. I think our game is to get out there and sell ourselves more to government, and we're starting to do that now. We've got Rick on board, working with Mark Falber at the front, and we have to do that in a united way. We can't go out and individually start selling our sport, member federations, FFA, associations, clubs. When other sports go out, they go out together, and that's what we need to start to do, and I think you'll see more of that now start to happen with, with FFA, with member federations, with associations because we do have more participants than any other sport. But it's so surprising that governments still don't realise that. But we have to actually reflect and ask ourselves, why is that? And we have to do a better job of selling ourselves. The other thing I'd like to say is we've got special guest from us, John Fain, the Mayor of Penrith, who's recently contributed financially to bring the, guy, the Matilda's game here to, uh, here to um, or obviously to Penrith, to sell out game, fantastic supporter, and spending some time with John and his colleagues last night, it's really clear that there are a lot of people that do want to invest in football and, and we need to make sure that we leverage that for the women's game. Now you should know as a journalist, I'm not going to let you get away with something that you just sparked a little light bulb in my head. When you talk about togetherness, does that suggest that as a game, and let's be honest, if, if we're being brutally honest about this, over the last 20, 30, 40 years, this is a game that has eaten itself by, in large degree. Are we still divided? We're not speaking with a united voice? I still think there's more work to be done there. And I think that it is challenging because we're, we're a big game. We've got, you know, FFA, nine member federations, nine A-League and W-League clubs, um, 100 <laughs> associations, 2,000 clubs across the country. And making sure that we actually work together, I think, is important. We're starting to see great signs of working with Stuart and Peter Hug in the government space. We're starting to do more, um, certainly with, with um, FFB. Uh, but drilling down below and us working collectively below is really important that when we go to government, we go with some really clear, consistent messages. And I, just, I still think there's some more work to be done on that regard. Uh, Emma, I'm just going to stick with you for the moment. Uh, last year we had, I think it was the first ever female football week that was launched two years ago. Two years ago my apologies. Um, are we going to repeat that initiative again this year? Is that something that you, know, you want to put more resources behind, something you want to grow? something that had a big impact? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, I think the Female Football Week is a really great example of something that kind of emerged from the grassroots because federations and associations were starting to just have some more focus <laughs> around International Women's uh, Day and that whole week. And FFA, um, you know, decided to, to coordinate that and provide a, a national campaign. And um, it's had a massive impact. And certainly we think it's important that in the short term we do have that focus that brings people together uh, that encourages more girls to get involved, but encourages women to get involved in all levels of the game. Uh, you know, and I know there's a lot of people here from, from clubs, from associations, and I think that there's a lot more we can do in that space. I'd love to see every club, every association, 
and really activating around that week because I think one of the challenges we have in the women's game is visibility and there's a lot of girls that still don't know where to go and what opportunities are available. So as much as we can get that out there and tie that also with the Matildas and use our Matildas and use our W League players to connect with girls, um, it's only going to make the game bigger. A couple more questions and I'm going to open it up to the floor. So uh, have a think if you've got a question for, for any of our esteemed panel. Um, Luke, David obviously mentioned the, the 2023 World Cup bid. Uh, if Australia was to be successful in that bid, what, what would that do for your business commercially? Would it have an impact? Yes, no? Absolutely. No, no. no. Look, it, it provides a focus. Um, you know, it, it's great to have a World Cup at any time. And, and obviously we're looking forward to, to 2019 in France. But um, to have uh, a, uh, a World Cup in Australia, does a couple of things. It provides certainly a focus for everybody. Um, it's, we've got a legitimate chance of winning in 2019. I think we've got an even better chance of winning if we're uh, playing in a final in Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane. Um, so that, that also provides a, a level of uh, excitement. We know from the Olympic Games, we know from hosting Rugby World Cups that participation grows, you know, interest from the media grows. All of those things are, 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 are buoyed by Australia hosting a tournament. You know, one of the great challenges for women's sport, not just football, is less than 10% of media coverage of sport in Australia is for women's sport. So uh, having a World Cup is only going to assist media interest as well as we, uh, as we progress towards 2023. So it, it, it lifts, uh, lifts all boats. And David, just to, on, a, on a, a similar sort of a theme, um, you mentioned that you're in negotiations to try and get a free-to-air deal for, for the W League. Um, we know that you know, selling football in a media space is, is difficult, particularly with the commercial channels. How close are we to a deal? It's all right, you can just tell us, some of your journalists and 250 <laughs> people in the room. <laughs> we won't tell anybody, <laughs> the phones away. Um, are you close to that? And, and you know, would a, a successful World Cup bid perhaps help drive that interest more long term? Definitely would long term. I mean, I think this year is, um, a year with more emphasis on uh, the double headers that have been successful for us in the last couple of years. So um, we're a bit frustrated that the ABC pulled out because we thought that we were providing them with um, a good piece of content. Um, so yeah, I can't tell you, Luke can probably give you a score out of 10 how close we are to, we, to getting another free to air for this season, but what I am confident in is, is that while we might have a bit of a glitch this year, in the next few years, there will be a free to partner with Fox Sports for the W League. Um, I've got no doubt about that. This year, um, we just didn't quite perhaps get it right um, in terms of the, the mix, but I think it'll happen. Um, one of the things about 2023 is it, it's actually a bit of a way off. If we were to get awarded that World Cup, say, in 2019, there's a lot of runway to do a lot of great things in the lead up to it. One of them will be to get real focus into the W League. So, can I just... Uh, sure, we'll just... Of course. One of the things we've done this year with the W League is actually give it due respect in the way we scheduled it. And um, by that I mean that, you know, we made a decision early in the process that we would play games on Sunday at 4.30. Why? Because we're playing in summer, 4.30 is a bit cooler. Also because we wanted to have a consistent time. Um, and we worked with Fox to, uh, to, to lock that time in. Unfortunately, that time, for, for reasons uh, of their own making, uh, doesn't work for the ABC. But at the same time, we also said we want to get another game on there. Because if you look historically at the W League, it's scheduled all over the place. Um, different time slots, different, different venues. So we, uh, we managed to work with our clubs and our venues and with Fox to be able to lock in a 5.30 Friday evening game as a lead in to the, the 7.30 p.m. Uh, A-League game, which, which we think is a fantastic step forward. Um, you know, two games covered on Fox is great. We obviously uh, want more and we're working with them to get all games covered over the next couple of years. But it, it was a decision that we made to actually honour the game and respect the game and actually schedule and stick to that rather than um, probably being as fluid as we've been previously and a bit all over the place. And, and so that may hurt us in year one from a free to air point of view, but uh, it'll, uh, it'll do us a hell of a lot of good over the long term based on discussions we've 
Okay, uh, those are all my questions for the moment. Have we got any questions from the floor? Stick your hand up. A couple of questions, David. Yeah. Um, we talk about opportunities and pathways for the position for the female. Uh, yet over the last 10 to 15 years, we've actually reduced the age groups at nationals. Um, going forward, there is a sentiment that the A League clubs are supposed to be working in this space. Where do you see the future of the game going, particularly for country athletes, um, in relation to the development? I'll have a stab at that and then you might want to jump in. So. <laughs> I mean, I think similar to in the men's space, the transition through to um, proper uh, structures in A-League clubs with um, full academy structures, so full depth, um, is still a work in progress. And, and therefore, it's a work in progress clearly for the women's game as well. Um, I think what we've seen over the last few years is is a um, is some difficult decisions have, have been made as those academy structures have been put into place. Um, the change in the age groups at nationals um, is something that probably you should answer, Em. But um, I think we're still in an in an unsettled period in that transition. Once we get things a bit more settled in the men's side, then. Hopefully there'll be a knock-on into the women's side as well. Yeah, just I mean, just to add to that, I think generally the men, the, the boys and the girls pathways have, 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 have been very narrow um, and probably very metro focused for a period of time before how academies and how clubs have come into the pathway. Um, our view is, is that obviously we want to broaden that, and that philosophy is on the boys and the girls side. And you know some of the things that we want to start talking about are things like what we call a talent support centre, which could be rolled out regionally to support both talented boys and girls. But what I would say is something that you know we're doing a lot of work nationally, um, which we want to start to work with federations a bit more on. From our research, is that uh, the best footballing nations for for women have their most talented players playing with boys, um, and that is a consistent theme that we've seen across all countries, and only just recently. Uh, the, in the UK, they've actually opened it up for any boys and girls to play together up to the age of 18 with no need to seek any clarification around, you know, support, etc. So um, we do have to think a bit differently, I think, in Australia around how we're going to grow the girls' game and part of that answer will be boys and girls playing together. And I've got Sarah Walsh in the room, she played with boys, you know, for a very long time and lots of the Matildas did. Um, so I think in regional areas uh, we need to think a bit differently. but. We agree that for the boys and the girls' pathway, we need to be tapping into regional talent. We can't just be focused in the metro area. And today, we have been, and that's why, what I would emphasise is that how clubs coming into the pathway, how clubs are not the pathway. They are a part of that. Um, so some players will go through the how um, support, and some might stay in NPL, and some might be in regional, and that's all fine, and players' journeys will be different, and, and we need to make sure we're supporting that. Emma, can I just pick up on that? Too? Am I right in saying that clubs like the Central Coast Mariners have partnerships out in the regions with, with various clubs? And if that's the case, does that include girls, women, or is it just boys, men? Um, I think their focus traditionally has been on the boys' side. I mean, I think for a lot of the... Well, obviously, Central Coast Mariners is slightly different. They're the only club that doesn't have a, a W League team. Our philosophy around um, uh, the W League side, is, particularly the A League, is that you know, we really want the A-League clubs to get the W-League team right, to get the right conditions and support in place. We've got Ante Zurich, who's not only a, um, works with the South Wales, but he's the head coach of the W-League team, and obviously with Sydney, and you know, there's um, uh, a lot of focus on making sure that we work with A-League clubs around that space, and in the short term, we feel that the member federations are best place to continue to grow the girls' pathway. But I can say this, it's getting more competitive, uh, countries, you know, in Asia, particularly like Japan, are spending a lot of money on the girls' pathway. So we, we, we can't just rest on our laurels. We've got talented players coming through. We need to build depth. We need to continue to focus on growing the base uh, to make sure that we stay competitive at international level. David, how close are we to having the Mariners in the W League? I know they want to be part of it. I love asking those questions. The look at his face. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think we, again, in terms of the strategic choices that were taken, they were not only taken between um, things uh, outside women's football, they were taken within women's football as well. So um, we want to move to a full home and away structure for the W League. That's really important. Um, we did some surveys across the actual play, playing groups in W League, um, and it was great to hear the feedback that getting that proper home and away structure in many respects more important to um, to the players than some of the more financial things that were on the table at the time. Um, so I think we look we took decisions around the funding of of the salary cap, the funding of minimum wage conditions, those kind of things when we could have just left that and added a team from the Central Coast. Um, we want all of our clubs, uh, A-League clubs, to have W-League structures, um, but this time there was a choice that we were going to put our money into the, the CBA-type matters. Um, next time, I, I would like to see us get um, the money on the table to have more in terms of a proper home and away, so more matches, and then perhaps we look at expansion to more teams in the W League. Um, I think there's opportunity, if you look at US female structures, there's also opportunity to have um, a depth to, to the W League in terms of divisions below. Um, that kind of thing is a fair way off, but we've got to keep our eye on that because there, uh, just talking to someone last night, you know, there are really healthy structures out there um, that are uh, developing female players that are not necessarily yet connected to either the A-League or the W-League. Uh, any other questions? Hi there. Um, you've mentioned the Mini Roos a couple of times, and now with a really strong brand the Matildas, have you considered rebranding that to be Mini Tildes or something a bit more gender neutral? Ah, this is a great question. Because <laughs> <laughs> I sat around the management team when we came up with this name. Um, and and I, I always felt a little bit uncomfortable that bruise meant socceroos, but you can answer it. <laughs> Who chose it, David? Come on, point fingers. Point fingers. No, that was right there. Yeah, I reckon I've just been well and truly thrown under the bus. It's your brand, isn't it? It's not my brand. It's football's brand. But uh, anyway, uh, no, look, I think that what, when we went through that process, we tested a number of um, different names, and we wanted to, we went from small side football. Small side football, it was not fun, it wasn't engaging. We obviously transitioned to Mini Roos. There was a program, obviously, previously with Roos uh, Connected. For us, if we think it's important we do have one kind of nah, overarching brand that caters for both boys and girls in that 4 to 11 space, we don't feel that it would be the right thing to stop to, to split that out. Um, but we have more work to do to really start to create like that girls only brand within Mini Roos and we're starting to do a lot more work around that. So, you know, massive strategic opportunity. I've, I've said this before, and I think I mentioned it yesterday, that kickoff space, that kind of food, that, that, that taster for the game is so perfect to get girls involved that I'm not quite sure whether they're, they're ready to, to jump into club football. So that's a strategic priority for us. We've obviously invested a lot in the Mini Roos brand. I'm really pleased that we've got Aldi on board, who spent a lot of money last year in helping us to advertise the game. Um, you know, outside of our structures, above and beyond what they provide as a sponsorship. As a result of that, we're able to provide development offices to member federations, which are not just focused on mini roos, but are actually, we have development offices in there which are specifically focused on girls' football as well, because we see that as a, as a strategic um, priority. Um, but there is a lot of investment that's gone into the brand, and we need to do more to pull up the girls' side, um, and probably pull through the Matildas, but splitting it off into mini Matildas or mini roos, it's kind of carving the game out, and we don't really feel that that would be the right thing to do because boys and girls will still want to play together, and, and that's important. I'd like to say that, I mean, we want more girls to play, but I played with boys. I always, and I love playing with boys, but you've got some girls that like to play with girls. So it's about how we actually create different opportunities for girls and package that in a way that's attractive to, to different types of girls that might have different motivations. Women don't play when's that going to come about? What was that? Women's FFA Cup. Oh. Jeez, you hit me. I'd love to see a Women's FFA Cup. Uh, I'd, what I'd say is people don't 
probably quite appreciate the journey to get to the Men's FFA Cup. And the journey to get to the Men's FFA Cup was a national competition review um, on the men's side, which then led to the creation of the MPL. And we did, we've done the same on the women's side. We've had national competition review, individual federation reviews, and we've started to create the MPL. As some of you would have seen from my presentation yesterday, we're still not there. We've only got 50% of the member federations with MPL competitions. We need to get that right. Um, and the other interesting thing for those that are really connected to the women's game will understand is, a lot of our MPL, a lot of W League players play in the MPL. Um, they're not just registered to, you know, connected to the one club, and also a lot of the Matildas are playing internationally. So I think actually bringing the FFA Cup to life for women is going to be slightly more um, complicated. But coming from England, I mean, the, the, the FA Cup over there for women is probably, uh, you know, the best game that they have each year in terms of their experience. They get the, the biggest crowd. So I'd love to see us be able to do that here. Any others? Yes? I've got a question. We've been talking about um, player pathways for females. Um, is there anything that FFA are doing for coaching to encourage women into coaching and creating a pathway for them? Because imagine having a female coach for the children's work. That would be awesome. <laughs> we did have one, didn't we? Has to bring in the role. It's not, not Australian. Yeah. Yeah. Dutch. 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 Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. Um, we have done a lot of work nationally. We have a female mentor program. So people like Ray Dower, Heather Garriott, Leah Blaney are actually have been part of that program. And what you'll actually see with our national teams now is instead of having just one assistant coach, we're actually exposing a lot more of the, those potential females. Um, because we, we do have an ambition to make sure that we have a female coach of the Matildas. That's something that we would love to see. Of the of the young Matildas, and we've obviously got Ray at the moment over there coaching the under 17. So we have identified female coaches that we'd like to work with because I think we have to be really targeted. And it isn't just about what happens on the pitch; but it's also about what happens off the pitch now. So we have to make sure we're properly supporting females. Having said that, I do think there's some work for us to do, and and we we to work on helping females in all of the structures. So. It always shocks me that we don't have, even in the women's NPL, a lot more females coaching in that space. That's a massive stepping stone. You know, Heather Garriott came from that, that space now and has come into the, you know, the national team structure and is obviously coaching Canberra United. Um, I think we need to get more females in, in NPL as a starting point. Uh, coming from a grassroots level, what do you see as the biggest challenges ahead? to bridge the awareness gap between grassroots and the top level? Um, is it player access? Is it the W League season? Is it the TV rights? Um, are there other things in that, that space? David, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. just said, no, it's all right. You can answer it. <laughs> um, I think that, look, I think there's a lot of things that we can do. Obviously, the fact that the W League is over the summer, is a slight challenge because I, I know how grassroots works and I know that you know people kind of stop at a certain time, although summer football is probably keeping a lot more people busy than it, than it was previously. Um, so that, that is a challenge, but I, I think it's about, to be honest, I think that if we actually work together as a sport and we can kind of close those gaps a bit more and, and make sure that we're communicating um, you know, more frequently as one, I think we can start to break down um, some of those barriers uh, and certainly, you know, up, these female players are fantastic. We had them at Penrith last night and they were knackered and there was like 30 girls waiting to get autographs and they will work and work. They just want to work to promote the game. So I don't think the issue is that the players don't want to get out there. They do. They actually want to do more because they really are passionate about growing the game. I think the key thing is probably a bit more coordination between all stakeholders to make sure we can start to, to leverage that and get the girls into the right areas. But free to air is a, is a component of that. Cricket. Uh, with their women's BBL, being on Channel 10, it does, it has a massive impact in terms of girls being able to see, you know, um, their heroes more frequently. Um, but we've got a fantastic Fox deal. We need to keep focused on free-to-air, um, but we also need to get focused on getting those players and visibility more at the grassroots. Do you want to talk a bit about the digital? Yeah, I, I did. I wanted to say that it's, it's kind of a virtuous circle. Um, for me, we, we need more girls playing the game. And we need them to come in through mini roos or through clubs or through schools or through church groups. I don't really care where. But we want them to have a great experience. We want them to have fun. We want them to have a social experience. And if they have fun and have a social experience, 
they'll grow a love for the game, and they might keep playing or they might not, but we, they'll keep watching the game, and they'll keep being involved in the game in some way. But it's got to start at that level. There's no doubt that you know the more we see the game exposed, the better, uh, the, the more chances we're going to get more girls come in. But you only have to walk into a school these days, and, and the balls are all round. You know, there's basketballs and there's footballs. I remember when my son started school, he was <coughs> shocked when I was in Melbourne to walk into a primary school and not see an AFL ball, just see footballs and basketballs. So we've got to make sure that we're giving kids the best possible experience when they come into the game. And then they'll drag mum and dad along. They'll drag mum and dad to come and watch the W League and the A League. They'll, they'll tune into TV and the, and the world will grow for all of us. Um, Data Talk touched on digital. One of the things that we're doing at the moment is, is a significant investment in digital um, because digital has the ability to unite the game like we've never united it before. You know, we, we, we have historically, we've, we've talked a little bit up here this morning about probably the splits in the game, but you know, we have um, a digital platform across our nine member federations and across our A-League clubs in the FFA, where three quarters of the traffic on that digital platform is from participation, right? The, the great mountain power in that, in that product is, is the people out there kicking the ball. So we're building a better experience for participants to make it easier for them to register, to make it easy for them to actually interact with their club and make it easier for their clubs to interact with them. But also it's designed to connect them into the W League and the A League and actually give them a united single football experience across the game. So again, it's a better experience that keeps them more connected to the game. And if that happens, more people are watching, more people are playing, more money comes in. Um, we're almost out of time for this panel. Would maybe have time for one more question. There's three of you with your hands up. Who was first? I think it was. Okay, great. Is there any thought process about engaging ex Matildas? Uh, there's a lot of ex Matildas that live in the regional and they don't have the As soon as you say that stuff, the thought that comes into my head is the game does a really poor job of celebrating its history, um, and part of that is celebrating its ex-players. Um, and, and I think we have started to make some progress in that regard, but we're a fair way behind in where we should be um, in both the, in terms of ex-Socceroos and ex-Matildas. Um, more money means an opportunity to do that that kind of thing, but um, it frustrates me that the game's memorabilia and ex-players are part of the game's memorabilia. The game's memorabilia is in a warehouse in Botany. In Botany. Um, you know, to me that's extraordinary and we've got to be able to do something about that. It unlocks uh, the opportunity to celebrate the past, celebrate what our players have done. Um, and, 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 and all I can say to you is, uh, we need, that sort of stuff needs champions, so it needs people to help and to say, I'm prepared to, I'm prepared to contact all those women that I played with from this period to this period. Then come to us and say, what can you do if I get this group? We've done a bit of it over the last few years, but in bringing back groups of, pl of players um, to celebrate occasions at FFA, um, the most recent that I can think of was the, um, the team that came in, the, who were young Socceroos, I think, in the 1980-something game. And, I mean, um, this is uh, a moment to, to reflect on the sort of stuff Mike Cockrell did in the game, but Mike was part of that day, and we had people fly in from England who, who were Australian players, but they are now living in England. It was a great occasion. Um, but it needed, it needed champions and it needed uh, someone to prod us a bit to help. But yeah, my first reflection on your question is, it's just another example of something that we're a bit shit at.
Um, I will add to that that next week we 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 are we do have a function in Newcastle, and Sarah Walsh is obviously an ex-Matilda who works closely with me, and we we have talked about that we need to do more to engage our ex-Matildas, and hopefully next week will be the start of us doing more more of that. But I also think your point's a great one, which is there's probably Matildas out there, ex-Matildas. Well, I don't say ex-Matildas, Matildas, because as we heard yesterday, once Matilda, always a Matilda. Um, who want to actually help grow the game as well. Um, so I think there's certainly more that we can do and, and we're building. I'm looking at Sarah now because I think that's a great idea and we can definitely get you some <laughs> kit to go out there and, and, and help us to grow the game because we're all about that. And a museum of football, I know, is part of the whole of football plan that was released in 2015, just waiting on the cash, I assume, at the moment to get that up and running. Yeah, I mean, it would be a great. It would be a great thing to unlock all of that that memorabilia. Um, sort of have a call to arms. I think that if people have got stuff that they're prepared to um, lo even loan to us, we just need a location for it. Um, as I say, we've made some progress in that regard. If you come to FFA now, um, when I first walked in the door, looked at the reception, I thought, wow, it looks like we're coming into a firm of accountants. Um, at least when you come through the door now, there's trophies, um, there's tables for W League and A League, there's pictures of players. Um, and so, you know, it's small steps, that stuff, but I readily acknowledge we're not that good at it. Can I just do a bit of call to action, which I think sure. is really important? We're part of this uh, initiative called Mount Chapters for Change, and one of the things that they talked a lot about is audit in the face of your organisation. And that's about, if I go to a website, what do I see? If I, you know, if there's an event happening, what do I see in terms of male, female players and, um, uh, you know, or even administrators or whatever. And I think that everyone in this room can do those small things. And if you walk into FFA now, you see the W League, you see the A League, you see male players, you see female players. And that's something that David has led since he came. But I think everyone in the room can do that. And that makes a massive difference to what people see at the grassroots. Uh, we are running a little bit over time, but I think this is an interesting conversation, so I'm happy to go for one more question if we can. Yep. Um, you touched back on what Audi are doing beyond their cash investment. Luke, what are you looking for in commercial partners in the women's game beyond the cash and writing the check? And how does that play down to what clubs and associations should be looking for when they're going out to partner around the women's game? Absolutely. Look, what, what we're looking for in the women's game is no different to what we look for across the whole of the game. You know, you want. Um, other than cash, cash is, is pretty nice, but you, you want a partner that's going to work with you to help to promote football. And Aldi is a great example of that, but um, with you know their campaign, which, which to be fair was a little late coming to market this year, um, next year it won't be, but was was fantastic in terms of them. But, you know, they spent $5 million on media putting a campaign promoting kids football around the country. You know, we'd love to have the ability to do that. Um, equally, you know, NAB are a fantastic partner in, in doing similar things. You know, NAB have a big investment in another sport, obviously, but, um, you know, NAB are in football because that other sport isn't a national sport. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're doing a great job in working with us and, and not necessarily as, as, as obvious as Aldi above the line, but a lot of content, a lot of direct content going out to, into the football market. So we're looking with partners who are active participants in the game. It's great to have a partner that just gives you money but you actually want someone who's going to work with you to help and that's what we look for. Luke, can I just finish off by picking up on that? Um, Steph tells me that when she goes to do W League games, her favourite club to go and visit, she likes them all, but, but the one that really stands out in, it, in the way that it's organised and the way that it's backed by the whole city, the whole community and the local sponsors all of them is Canberra United. <laughs> Now, they're not affiliated to an only club, because of course there is no only club in, in Canberra at the moment. When you're looking to expand the W League ultimately, does it have to be you know, aligned to an A League club because that's the branding, or could it be a standalone club like Canberra United? And is that in a way even more beneficial because they've got a whole city to themselves? It's a very, very good question, Simon, and I'm sure my uh, esteemed colleagues have their own, uh, their own points of view. Well, you want the best club. That, that, that's probably the simplest answer. You want the, the best possible club to give the best possible experience for the, for the athletes, for the fans, and, and to actually add to our competition. Now, um, you know, there's a lot to be said for aligning with A-League clubs because A-League clubs have significant resources, and, and you know, Melbourne City, again, is, is an example of that. But ultimately, when we do expand the W-League, you want the best possible club 
to, uh, to, to do the best possible job in the market. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, it's important that when we took that decision around Central Coast Mariners, we have to take exactly the same approach as I would need to take to the A-League. We have to give it the respect to say, what is the area that this is going to grow? Where, you know, where is there's going to be great growth? What's the criteria that's important to help grow the W League? Um, and, and all of those things that Luke's touched on are a critical part of that. Um, you know, it's about what can this club do to help grow the W League, not just about what the league will do to help the club. And there, there's some of the discussions that we had around that. I think education institutions are an interesting part of that decision down the track. The universities and colleges have, have great structures that we, we could tap into more and ultimately that can actually help the elite level of women's football. I'm sure we could discuss all these issues for about the next four hours, but uh, we do have on the panel. So, ladies and gentlemen, please thank Emma Hollywood, Tony Gunn, and Luke Brown.